Hello, I'm Martin Mercer. And I'm James Mastriani. You've never heard of us. We're two Brits who grew up in North London and have had varying success in the film and television industry. In our ever-advancing age, we find ourselves on... The The Wrong wrong Side side of of Hollywood. Hollywood. In our series of podcasts, we'll share our experiences of what it's like being a British bloke living and working... Or not. ...in the biz. We'll discuss everything from fish and chips to things that wind us up. So stay with us. It's all uphill from here. This podcast may contain strong language. If you're of a sensitive nature or easily offended, we invite you to, as they say in Blighty, jog on. Morning. (laughs) (laughs) Hello. Hello. It's a nice sunny day, so I think winter is well and truly behind us now. Careful what you say. (laughs) You know, it's going to start thundering in about five minutes now that you've said that. No, it's true. But as nice as it was, it is nice to have a bit of sun. Bit excited today because we have another guest. We do. Yes. We do. Shall we announce who it is or shall we wait until she gets here? Um, Well, we'll just butter her up a bit. Yes. First of all, it's a her, which is nice because it can get a little bit mannish in here. (laughs) (laughs) And so that's good. And also what I love about this person is what I love about LA. You have all these people who worked on these amazing projects because, you know, that is what this podcast is about. It's about working, dare I say it, in the trenches in the film industry. <laughs> and you had uh, to say it. Didn't you? Of course I did. Be rude not to. And this person has done this. And Boss Films was one of the places she worked at. And Boss Films is just an amazing visual effects company, a kind of icon of the 80s. And so she worked there, Ghostbusters. and Yeah, I was going to say at least one, two, three, four, five of some of my all-time favourite movies of the 80s. Yeah. And yeah. she was a part of it. Yeah. So just that alone, apart from all the other stuff, is exciting. So that's good. And it kind of goes back to Heiko, our other guest, who Ghostbusters was a film that got him aware of cinema and started on his journey to becoming the artist he is today. So, yeah. so that's kind of a nice link. And then, oh, uh, talking of film, we went to Renfield we screening. Did. We did. I it, managed to sort of obtain a ticket for your good self. I was laughing because when I was listening back to that episode and I said, oh, wait, could you get me a ticket? And you were like, no. Yeah. And you quickly moved on. And then lo and behold, I know. Martin invited me to go see it. And it was a fun evening and uh, picked up Heiko and his girlfriend. Um, April. Thank you. <laughs> Picked up my girlfriend and his girlfriend, That's April. Like a deer in headlights. Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> Sorry, Yeah, April. no, it was Universal Studios, wasn't it? And they laid on, as I said, they were popcorn, all the treats and drinks. And free parking. Yes. I was surprised. Yeah. Even if we didn't go and see the film, the free parking. It was worth would have it. Been, that's uh, that's you know, really <laughs> and, sniffing there. And I got to meet a few people on the, uh, not so much in the trenches, but more commanders. I met the director. Yeah, Chris Bacay. Yep. And the producer. Yep. Samantha Nezimbom. And also one of the other producers who was on The, bloke the Walking built, Dead. He didn't write no, a comic, did he? Comic. He, produced no, but he, the show. he produced the show. Yeah. Um, he was a very nice man whose name is forgotten. Yes. But I always get very shy. I'm you, going to admit to something. I'm going to put do. my invisible hand in the air and say I do get very shy. And Heiko and April were very forthright. Not shy. They're not shy. And they got you in there and you hobnobbed with the makers of this business. And he was a very nice man, the unknown gentleman. I'm looking him up because yeah. I don't want to do this Quite. at the end. Hurry up. <laughs> Yeah, so I get very shy. I, I don't know why. I, it's that feeling if you're a bit of a fraud or you don't belong. It's really weird. Yeah, but why is that? Because if know. anybody belongs, it's you. You've been doing this since you were in your early 20s. And I know, worked on the fucking film. I don't know. It's very strange. I just get all shy and my lips get dry. I, um, and I become very aware of myself. Like, oh, God, look at me. Oh, God, the jeans are too skinny. Oh, Christ. Oh. Why do you do that? I don't know. Psychological. It's weird. Very that's, strange. But anyway, you got crazy. to meet those people. Yeah, the film wasn't bad, was it? No, it was actually very entertaining. The action sequences were brilliant. Yeah, it really well And there done. was a lovely yeah. surprise right at the end. Yes. Which I won't spoil, but it was just so unexpected and just hilarious. Yeah. But yeah, your boards were first up. Well, no, we did so many sequences. And this is how Chris McKay works. Because he comes from animation, mm. Robot Chicken was his thing. Then he did right. uh, the Lego movie and that, boom, that was it. He was on the rocket to Mars. And so Chris comes from animation. So, of course, 
in animation, like Heiko was saying, everything is built. There's nothing existing right. already. Yeah. Everything is created. So Apart Chris from script. What a script, yeah. yeah. But I'm talking about visually. Yeah. So that world had to be created. So Chris does that. He brings us in or the other guys in and we'll have a go at each scene. And you'll just do animatic after animatic. And then Chris will find his process in there. And so I was glad to see one of the shots we came up with. It was in the script where a head gets knocked off. Yes. I'm not going to say any more for those who haven't seen it. The head gets knocked off and it goes through the window and it lands on a car with a kind of villain inside. In the script, it said the head gets knocked off and lands on the bonnet of the car. And whilst I was looking at it, I was like, wouldn't it be cool if the head kind of span and landed at the side window and the evil guy turns and looks at it and sees his head there and the head slides off just leaving the eyeball, which they're both looking at each other. So I did that and it's in there. It's in yeah, it there. Is. And that's, that's nice, you know. Yeah, it was really good. I, I totally enjoyed it. Yeah, I totally no, I did. It. And it was very nice to see your name at the end credits, along with Heiko's and everybody yeah. else's. So yeah. that was good. I am one of these people that whenever I go to the movies, I will stay through the end credits. Yeah, I mean, you should really. Yeah. I mean, it's like looking at a painting and not knowing who painted it. Or who cared who painted it. But I have to say, it's really bizarre. I watched something the other day on Apple TV called Ghosted, which is actually a very fun film. But there were so many credits, mm. so many credits. There was probably mm. about 10 minutes of credits. Yeah. Porter potty, coffee server, <laughs> uh, assistant to the assistant to the assistant. Sometimes you see so many assistants. Don't get me wrong, PAs and assistants are very important. For sure. And there's respect there. But I guess it gets annoying when you get all that and then you look for your credit sometimes. Because it's like I worked on the film, uh, I always forget this film, Paul Thomas Anderson's film about the bloke with the knob, the big schlong. <laughs> What was that film? <laughs> I don't know. You see? Hang on, hang on. You talk about Adrian Brody. Is he in it? No. Uh, he used to be a model. He did Calvin Klein. Marky Mark is his old name. Okay. But what was the film? Well, it was about... Fact check. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> but now I boarded that film and everybody refers to that film. And it sucks because... It's like, well, you didn't do much on it. No, I did three weeks' work on it. But hey, if I was an actor and I did three weeks' work on the course, movie, yeah. I'd get a credit. And it sucks because people go there and it's a very renowned movie, so right. much so that we can't remember the name of it. <laughs> and basically, my name's not fucking there. Yeah, that, and it that kind is bad. Of, yeah, so... And like I say, credit where credit is due. And even if you did five minutes' work on it, you should get a credit. I yeah. Think. And when we talk to our guests, I'd be interested to see. I would imagine she did get the credits mm -hmm. because when I did makeup effects, image animation, right. say, or if I work for animated extras, right. then you would get a credit under them, you see, because yeah. the company's allowed so many credits. Yeah. yeah. So you're much more guaranteed it, as it were. Right. It's producer's discretion when yeah. you're below the line. <laughs> <laughs> producer's discretion. So it'll be interesting to see if our lovely guest got those. But anyway, very excited. And also we've got our food section. Yes. We went to the Continental Kosher Bakery, which is on Burbank Boulevard in North Hollywood. Yeah. And they survived the pandemic, which basically decimated <laughs> all the other businesses, a yes. lot of businesses. And so we got some nice kosher little bits and pieces. Excellent. Uh, yes. So Excellent. looking forward to that dunking. <laughs> All right. One other thing that I just want to touch on very quickly, Uwe, I just want to let our listeners know that every sound effect that you hear throughout our podcast... <laughs> They're all generated wah, 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 wah. by Martin Mercer, a.k.a. Prof. I'm going to have to take that one for when the joke goes flat. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Anyway, oh. moving on, I think it's time to bring in our guest, the lovely and talented and extremely wonderful Mary Claypool. Hey. Oh, and I didn't have to pay them to say that. Hi, <laughs> thank Hello. you for having me. Thank you for coming. We're very excited to have you here, Mary. Well, I'm thrilled and I'm honoured and I'm excited. Oh, Mary, now you're more James's friend than mine. <laughs> Usually it goes the other way around. James steals my friend. Well, it's early in the day. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I've seen you around, you know, at parties and stuff, but because I'm a bit shy... I'm not really... Yeah, we were just talking about this. We did a little <laughs> bit before you got here. We went to see Renfield. Uh, Martin oh, worked on Renfield. Oh, I wanted Renfield. to see that. How was it? I thought it was really good. But I have to say it because he's right here. Yeah. But it was really enjoyable. Really liked it. But Martin was like, 
oh, I, I, don't, I can't go up to people and introduce you. And well, I think a couple of your fellow boarders came by and Martin's like, this is James. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I whispered like, what it. The hell? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm right here. Well, I wouldn't have guessed that listening to some of your other podcasts. You right. come across bold and bright. <laughs> yes, he does. Oh, thank you. I can't, I can't but, shut him up, Mary. <laughs> but you have a fascinating history, and it's what we love about Los Angeles is people who you don't hear of. You know, nobody knows who we are, let's be honest. I mean, I speak for myself and James. Oh, but you have this wonderful history. Yeah. Well, no one's heard of me either, so it's okay. Yeah, but you've worked on all of this stuff. And I mean, I was just looking through your resumes and, and I was like, wow, oh, you went to LA City College. I went to Los Angeles Valley College, right? Yeah. Valley, so one, James. I meant, I meant that one, correction. And then um, Northridge, yeah. And then Northridge. Uh -huh. And you got a degree in journalism. Well, I started out, ever since I was a kid, I've always wanted to be creative and Writing was right. big. Loved to read, loved to write. I was the nerdy. I was the quintessential nerd. My mother bought my clothes <laughs> from Sears mail order back in the day and with straight pencil skirts and oversized blouses. I had the cat glasses, the pimples, the braces, the stringy <laughs> hair. I was the catch. So I was the total, total nerdette. And reading was my passion. And writing, I loved to do all that. So when I went to uh, Valley, there was an excellent school. It's still a great school. They had wonderful journalism classes there taught by journalists. And I excelled. I loved it. I wrote on the paper, did all that. Got my AA there and then matriculated on to Cal State Northridge where I wanted to study English literature and wasn't quite sure what I'd do with it. I'd just learn English and somehow, between the English and the journalism classes, I noticed radio, TV, film. That mm. was what it was called then. And I was dating a fellow who was a visual effects rotoscope person. Oh. Um, he's Emmy Award winner now. Wow. And he does a lot of visual effects. So we were dating. And I had always had to pay my own way through school. And after I had finished, he goes, you know, this place is hiring. Maybe you'd be interested. I thought, as what? Oh, they're looking for a production assistant. I said, what does that do? Just pretty much anything and everything. And he said, it's called Boss Film down in Marina Del Rey. <gasps> Boss Film. And uh, I didn't know really much of anything. I didn't have that much exposure to any entertainment work. So I send my resume when they had faxes. And, <laughs> what and, is a fax machine, Mary, for those that don't know? <laughs> and sure enough, they called me and uh, they hired me right off the bat. Amazing. And I didn't really know what was going on, but my boyfriend cued me in because he had worked on Blade Runner. And he <sighs> hold on, hold on, stop, stop. Huh? He had worked on Blade Runner. This yeah. gentleman who you're not naming, can you name? Yeah, his name is, was... <laughs> will always be Glenn Campbell. Not the country western singer, but Glenn Campbell. Yeah, wow. Yeah. And he had gone through a cameraman's training program. It's funny, he and all his buddies had been tour guides at Universal Studios. Huh. And everybody starts at some little point like that. And he had gotten special permission to go onto the back lot and kind of hang out with people who were working in departments and fields that he was interested in. And Doug Trumbull, who was the yeah. man who owned EEG and did Close Encounters, was part of a committee to select potential candidates to be part of this rare training camera program. Program, and Glenn was selected nice. and trained. And he came up through the ranks doing amazing things. He was a rotoscope person on trial. He worked on all these films. So anyway, it's like, oh, you're making the fact that's cool. So he goes, <laughs> yeah, he goes here, go for this job. And uh, I got it as a production assistant. So I'm not just some kid out of high school or even college. When I got out of high school, all right, I'm going to segue a little bit too, because when I got out of high school, I couldn't understand why I did not have a scholarship like all my other straight A buddies. I was a straight A student, mm. honor classes, and uh, came to find out that my full ride scholarship to UCLA had been thrown away. What? I've been what? It's Thrown a weird, away. Uh, this is a personal thing. My mother had passed away uh, a year before my graduation. Mm. And my father was like a raging alcoholic uh. and didn't want me to move away or go uh. away. And I was underage. I wasn't 18 when I graduated. So it's my assumption. I found this out really only about 10 years ago. 
through wow. sealed records that my scholarship was probably mailed to my house to the attention of my father or mother. He probably saw it, was drunk, and he destroyed it, and I never knew that. Oh, my so God. I went to work. I went to work as a stenographer at downtown L.A. City Hall, where wow. I worked for a year and a half. And after a year and a half of that, I thought, no. Fuck this. Excuse me. <laughs> no, oh, no, no, that's a beautiful, <laughs> beautiful so, words. Um, surprisingly, my father was quite good with the idea of me coming back to live or go back to school while living with him. And he seemed good with that idea. I think he was laboring under guilt. All oh, right. Yeah, I worked and I went back to school via Los Angeles Valley College yeah. and then went to Northridge and then moved out and then got involved in this weird way to boss film. Mm. But I had a lot of stenography training. I knew how to do phones. I knew how to type. Right. I had basic office skills. So I just ran the front office and I really wanted to do more. And I got involved with all the departments. There was optical and there was animation. There was rotoscope stage elements. And I was always helpful and a little bit smarter than the average bear. So after Ghostbusters, they were also working in tandem on the movie 2010 mm. because Richard Edlin, who ran the facility, he's yeah. the Academy Award winning guy yeah. from Star Wars. He believed that he could amortize his costs and do the most efficient work by having two feature productions in house at the right. same time. And that did work very well mm. if you could get two feature productions, right. yeah. which it did. So after those finished, they uh, promoted me to be a production coordinator. And then I wanted to learn more about the optical process. So I did optical lineup, right. which if anyone has ever thought about how opticals were done before there were just computers and digital. Oh, I've seen footage from Star Wars and lining up shot. I mean, I can't imagine anything more terrifying. <laughs> it's, it's so cumbersome yeah. and so ridiculous. You get these big, heavy metal synchronizers, and I was doing simple one and two element composites. Right. And the head of the optical department was this brilliant man named Mark Vargo, who had worked on the original Star Wars. He had a clip that he hung up over the camera that he operated, and it was one of the famous Star Wars shots where there's like, I don't know, 100 TIE fighters coming in. That must be Return of the Jedi. Right. Isn't that yeah, the oh, famous maybe one? So. Where there's, yeah. there's like three frames of it over the Millennium Falcon. Or yeah. Whatever. Well, there were all these elements yeah. that had to be lined up and done. And those kind of shots typically have to be shot and done dozens of times to right. get it just right because there are mats and there are components and elements. He did it in one take. Wow. What? And it was like this famous thing. So anyway, I got to train in that department on optical lineup. And I was Amazing. honored to be around these people who have really gone places. But I just wanted to learn. I didn't want to be in those mm. departments. So uh, then I met my first husband there, my first practice husband, I should call him. He was an editor there. I won't name his name. And, uh, <laughs> but it was great. <laughs> there was a, a great experience working there because so much happened. I was there a year working on Ghostbusters in 2010. You get to meet people and things happen. And, and a lot of things happened on that show. Right. Yeah. Just to interject, because there's so much richness I in know. there. You mentioned 2010, which is the sequel to 2001, A yes. Space Oddity, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, or even Odyssey, even. Oh, hello? <laughs> Oddity. Oddity works. I've just no. been corrected. <laughs> this is but, what we do. He gets it wrong, I correct him. Absolutely. That's his job. Uh, <laughs> that's only job. Uh, but it's such a great movie, and just to have to match those visual effects. And Richard Edlund was running this, and Ghostbusters at yes. the same time. Oh, yes. Which is another incredible film. And I always remember looking at Cine Effects magazine. Cine Effects, I wrote a few articles for them. You wrote a few articles? You did? Yeah, Don, Don Shea, Shea, right? Yeah, Don Shea. Yeah, wow. And because uh, I actually, going back to my boyfriend, Glenn, who also wanted to write, I said, why don't you write for Don? No, no. And I told Don, why don't you have him write? He's a good writer. He's in the midst of it. And it's great to have people who are in it who understand it. So he started writing for Cine Effects. And then later I approached Don, especially when I was working with Creature Effects. Okay. Later on, I worked for Rick Baker, and I wrote articles on some of the wow. future effects people. Wow. So, Come on, I mean, it's just Martin's antenna just. Oh went, my Ding. god! <laughs> no, they're already up. I was. Gonna, I didn't say Rick noticed that, but it's already. Well, up. I've always lived in the shadow of fame, just kind of touching it. But it's been fun to. But yeah, it wasn't Steve Johnson at Boss Films, right? Yes, he was. Yes, I met Steve Johnson because I worked on. <laughs> oh. <laughs> what? Now he's a well, character, isn't what? he? Bless him. Oh, he's yeah. a, a character. Yes. Yeah. 
It's <laughs> <laughs> a nice way of saying it. No, because I was going to say that I know all this stuff. I say that respectfully because I was a fan boy and sure. grew up in it and worked in it. And so does James, bless him. But the thing is, there's a lot of young people, and I've noticed this, they don't know. They want to be in it. They want to yeah. work in it, but they don't know. So that's why I'm trying not to be rude and interjecting too much. But oh, no, you please. mentioning all this stuff and it's just fantastic. I mean, all I can talk about is when I started there, it was just a company that did these cool things. And I didn't realize how cool it was until I was in it. And you're working with people just like anybody and their friends and you go out to lunch with them. And then later you realize, oh, my God, I was working around some of the greatest creative effects people who ever lived. Yeah. Right. Many of them have passed now, which is really yeah. sad. Yeah. But I'm one of these early people. I get up at the butt crack of dawn and I get to work. So immediately they <laughs> gave me the key and the code and I would come and I unlock. And the only person who was ever there earlier than me was the famous Matt painter, Matt Urisich. Oh, Matthew yes. Matthew Urisich. Okay. Yes. And he was upstairs. Big tall handsome just charismatic man who's delightful now Steady. there's a man who had stories and i'd always go up and hang out with him and he always carried his brushes in his mouth he always had like six brushes in his <laughs> mouth and he would talk and so how you doing and he'd be doing and i watched him paint that iconic opening shot of gozer tower yes uh, and yes. he'd be sitting there and he'd be explaining it to me and what he was doing and then he would just start talking did i ever tell you about the time i dated marilyn monroe no <laughs> he goes, yeah i mean she was nice i kept some clothes for her when she was out of town I, you know i don't really i'm not into blondes but she was a nice kid yeah nice kid <laughs> so he had these wonderful stories and i always brought him cookies because he had a sugar addiction but that was fun <laughs> here i was hanging out with matt urisich and then as people filtered in we'd always have morning coffee clutch and we'd all sit and talk and i was always the first to read the hollywood reporter and fill everybody in on everything oh, and richard wow. would come in but it was great. It, was, it really was like a family yeah. thing. And the things that had progressed from there, there's so many stories that I still wake up sometimes thinking, I forgot about that. That was great. You told me a very funny story when you had a meltdown on the phone where someone was playing a prank on you? Yes. Or, you want to elaborate on that a little oh, bit? Oh, I'm going to name names here. <laughs> Jim Chesney who was the transportation captain. I loved him. He was funny, irreverent, and witty, smart as a whip. He would come in and usually sit near my desk because all things transported between the studios and our place had to go through transportation. It was a union shop. Right. So I got to know him really well, and he had kind of a funny voice. He would talk, and he was kind of nasally. But he could mimic anyone <laughs> under the sun, anybody. And I answered the phone. There were multiple lines, and there were days where it was just blowing up. You know, boss film, hold please, boss film, hold please, boss film. So he called in one day, boss film. And he goes, hi, let me talk to Richard Ellen. This is Ivan Reitman, the director of yeah. Ghostbusters. Mr. Reitman, please hold. <laughs> it's me, Chesney. Uh, that, yeah, okay, that's not that funny, but it was pretty good imitation. He did this sort of thing to me all the time, invariably when I was busy. And this one day was insanely busy. And uh, Boss Film, hi, let me talk to Richard Edlin. This is Bill Murray. And I was infuriated. I don't know what I can say here, but <laughs> it, I was like, <laughs> God damn it, Chesney, I am fucking busy as hell here and I'm tired of your jokes. Just knock the shit up, blah, 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 blah. And it went on. It spewed for, you know, good 30 seconds maybe. And there was this long pause. <laughs> and I hear the unmistakable voice of the true owner. This is Bill Murray. I, I, I sort of died. And I, and I, I, Mr. Murray, I'm so sorry. I thought you were playing the joke. I thought there was someone else. I'm so sorry. Let me get Mr. Redland for you. Put him on hold. I bolted to Richard's office a few doors down. And he always sat in a director's chair, kind of wearing these African-looking safari fatigue things. And he always smoked unfiltered camels. And he's reading the script, doing a, a perusal of what our next project will be. And he's smoking. And I went, oh, Richard! And I, what? And I scared. <laughs> Startled him. He, he bounces back, he flinches, and I said, Bill Murray's on the phone. I thought it was Chesney, and I just told him to fuck off and die. I'm so sorry. Oh, I'm, please don't fire me, please. And he's looking at me, and it, it sinks in, and he's trying not to laugh. Yeah. <laughs> Genuinely like me, he goes, don't worry, you're not fired. Just put him through. Okay, okay. And shut the door. And so I shut the door. 
I ran back to the phone. Mr. Mary, I put you right through now. I'm so sorry. And they put him through and they immediately ran back to the door. And then I put in my ear to the door and I hear Richard, hi, Bill. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Uh, what? What? Oh, oh no, there's nothing wrong with her. <laughs> that was one of my most glorious moments. Yes. Did you ever meet Bill Murray after that? Uh, I avoided him. Uh, uh, I, I, I didn't want to know if he was like an elephant and never forgot. I did meet the other Ghostbusters, which, right. oh man, that was great. It was so cool to meet Harold Ramis. Yeah. And yeah. oh, and Sigourney Weaver. That yeah. was cool. The day I was interviewed for the job, I was being interviewed by my supervisor, a woman named Laura Buff. And someone said, Sigourney's here. And she, oh, show her in. And I'm sitting here. And all of a sudden, this presence comes up next mm. to me. I look up at Sigourney Weaver. And she's tall, slender. And surprisingly, she has a very plain face, but it's like a palette. It looked like a palette that you could paint. She was yeah. lovely. And she smiled at me. And I thought, it's like Courtney Weaver. Oh my God. <laughs> so that was awesome. And I uh, got to meet Dan Aykroyd and they signed a poster for me. They nice. were all just lovely. And I got a big kick out of meeting the actors and they were so humble. And I remember saying, Oh, it's so exciting to meet the Ghostbusters. And Ramus just said, Yeah, I'm two of the three stooges. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was brilliant. Excellent. Loved him. You know, with Ghostbusters, such iconic visual effects. And was that the first project you'd worked at Boss Films and then you'd actually gone and seen a screening of it? Was that when it clicked? You were like, oh, actually, this isn't just a garage I'm working in here. I tell you, I did not go to the cast and crew screening because one of the other workmates of mine wanted to go to Mexico for a week. So we went that and they came <laughs> right. back and saw it later. And I didn't think that much of it. But I will tell you, just toward the end of the schedule, you can throw more money at a project, but you can't give it more time. Mm. And there was such a crunch. It was literally opening in a week, and the opticals were not done. Wow. So they moved the optical department into hotels down the street, and they were working over 100 hours a week. Shut um up just doing it and they were like zombies they would come in there was almost a hushed reverence when they came in it's the opticals you know, <laughs> and, they, and they just watch them go upstairs shuffling up and they would work and food was brought to them and they were working under such time constraints wow. and duress and when i went to the movie i took some friends they were gonna go see this movie and see what it's like it was then i realized oh my god and if you watch the movie when we saw it the very opening shot of gozer tower is slightly transparent because they didn't have time Time to run another map. Really? It's I been never noticed. noticed. No. It's been corrected, but right. when we saw it, there was this oh so slight transparency. And I have the dead last credit on the film. <laughs> well, you got credited though as the production secretary. Yes, because oh. I saw that because I was watching Ghostbusters and yeah. I saw it, and it was a Mary Mason, and I'm like, wait a moment, that's Mary. And then I took a shot of it and I put it up and I said, it's really nice yeah. to see my friend's names and credits. Yeah, no, movie. awesome. I should not have had a credit. The reason I believe I have the credit is that the one of the... Because of Bill Murray. Uh, yeah, Bill Murray <laughs> insisted. Yeah. Well, the, uh, one of the producers and the man who was, an, I think, an art director on the magazine Heavy Metal. Mm. Oh, yeah, and classic. Michael Gross, not the actor, but Michael Gross, the artist, and he seemed very unfriendly. He's passed away, I should say, the late Michael Gross, and he would always stride in through the front lobby, would never say hello, wouldn't say goodbye. He would just act like he owned the place. That rankled me. I didn't care what your position was. I want to be acknowledged, sure. and I like a little simple courtesy, so totally. whenever I saw him pull up... I would jump up and stand right in his way. So he had to say, hi, Michael, how are you today? <laughs> um, fine. He looked at me like, who the hell is this girl? And <laughs> bye, Michael, good to see you. And I did this to him every single time. <laughs> and after a while, it was like training a dog. He'd come in, hi, Mary, hi, Michael. It's like uh, he's learning. See? And then he was the one I found out who put the credit list together. Uh, but, uh. oh my goodness, when the movie came out, I was confronted by all of the people who didn't get credit. Uh, and they really? wanted, what did you do to get credit? Alluding to the, I did sexual favors. Like, no, man, I just got in his face and said, hi and bye. <laughs> yeah. That's how you it works. trained him. I trained him. <laughs> yeah, they didn't believe that, it, but it's true. <laughs> oh, that's too funny because we were just talking about Martin being a storyboard artist. It's annoying when you do work on a movie, no matter how long or short the project is. It is. And you don't get a screen credit. Yeah. And I remember there was a couple of movies you did you worked a really long time on, and mm. we went to the movies to see it. Mm. And 
there was nothing. No, it was and, so uh, disappointing. It well, is. one of my big disappointments was Indiana Jones of the Last Crusade because oh. that was my first job. Well, I wasn't a trainee. I was like a junior model maker, art finisher oh. for the rats, and this, and I sculpted stuff and all that kind of stuff. And then there was no credit. And George Gibbs, special effects supervisor, wonderful man, he's a really good guy. Unfortunately, he's passed away. But he was like, "Yeah, sorry, Mark, they didn't have any room." And I was just like, "Ah, ah, it's really." Just not to see your name. Because yeah. we are in it. It's show business. People say, oh, you got paid. Yeah, but it's show business. It's an acknowledgement. Yeah. It's something you're proud of. And it is different because it doesn't cost anything. But now you have millions and millions of people yeah. working on shows. And it, it means a lot. Even if you don't have your own individual credit, it's nice to even be lumped in among them so that you can find it there. Right. Yeah, yeah, it means a lot. And uh, I enjoy looking at credits. I've yeah. been in a few where I've asked them not to put my name in you, the credits. You did mention yeah. that. What one was that, Mary? Oh, my God. You're going to make me tell you. Yes, because um, now we're going to go watch all it. Is. <laughs> <laughs> well, there were a lot of shows that came in after Ghostbusters in 2010. And one of them was a Bill Cosby. He was the executive producer and star of something called Leonard Part Six. And no one I have ever met ever heard of what it was other than those who worked on it. And it was just the stupid kind of secret agent-y kind of loosely based thing that dealt with animals. I think and, I've seen it, And I have to say. Oh, it was terrible. Do you know who Mark Stetson is? He's Academy Award winning effects supervisor yeah. now, but he headed up the model shop mm. for Boss Film and made that beautiful miniature city of New York for Ghostbusters at the big staple right. marshmallow okay. guy walks Oh, yeah. 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 So I had to take him, a couple people, to this ranch somewhere in godforsaken part of San Bernardino where they had ostriches because they had a double for Bill Cosby. Bill Cosby is a big, tall guy, and the double was like maybe five foot six. And, <laughs> <laughs> but he was a jockey sized guy and he thought I could ride an ostrich so we had to take him out to see if he could ride an ostrich that's one of the weird things oh in my, my restaurant can that. you ride okay. an ostrich yeah yeah <laughs> riding an ostrich so I had to take him out to do that and then there's also a need for a big lobster I was very upset about this they went out and found a hundred year old lobster and they had to kill it in order to make the mold of its body oh, for gee. this stupid articulated thing I thought really you couldn't just create one so it was just an atrocious movie. It was stupid. And Bill Cosby, boy, I will say I was not very pleased with him. He seemed to think women were there to be sexually shocked. So you weren't shocked when all those allegations came out about him? No, no, it really wasn't. Yeah. And he had no problem with dropping his pants because somewhere, I thought I had it, there's a picture of him in his like boxers and he has his socks with the garters holding them up his shirt and he's smoking a cigar. I thought, yeah, it's a classic. But he just seemed to have that, you know, attitude. Sorry if I'm casting aspersions, but I wasn't that impressed. No, so I no, think, I think your dispersions have been uh, sort yeah. of illustrated. Well, yeah. until you cast. Until yeah, you so that was when I said, please don't. Oh, you, what do you mean you don't want a credit? I mean, I don't want a credit. Don't put my name on right. this dog. <laughs> don't credit so. me. <laughs> and of course you got one. Yeah, you got one, right? Yeah. You asked him to take it off. I said, please don't even put it on there. So I honestly have never seen the whole thing thing and hopefully they didn't right. i think they gave it to someone else give it to whomever give it to the guy on the street i don't care moving away from mr cosby i know there's a load of other stuff you've done as well but being a foamer i just can't help myself <laughs> oh, yeah. but you did big trouble in little china you yeah. did fright night yeah. which to me is one of those films you can watch again it was so well done yeah. and the boss film effects this is where it more seeged into the creature stuff even though you were doing that on ghostbusters obviously with the, the hell dogs and yeah. various stuff but this is such a classic Classic. Do you have any stories from that? Because that was a Steve Johnson extravaganza, wasn't it? <laughs> yes, and I had been promoted at that time to become the effects production coordinator. So you have to oversee all of the elements that are being produced for the project, and that's creature effects too. It's funny how things were. The visual effects was a different building on Maxella Avenue, and the model shop and the creature shop were around the corner down the street on Glencoe. So the visual effects sort of had a veneer of sophistication. It's like, here we are in Olympus, 
years. <laughs> and then we come down here, the, the model shop people do adequate work. And then there's the creature shop. And it's like the monkey zoo where everybody's yeah. throwing things around and having a fine time. <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, they're, they're, it's... Martin's familiar. Don't yeah. get me wrong. My dearest friends are creature effects people. And they're immensely talented. And I met some of the premier talented people. It was there I met Steve Wang. Wow. Uh, Craig Caton, who I mentioned to Legends. you, is a visual effects guy. I mean, just everybody who was anybody worked there. And the talent was just oozing. It's almost like you're perennially stuck in a mindset of eight-year-olds. <laughs> yes. And, 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 and I, I can think, vouch for that. But I think that's why it was so unimpeded creativity. The flow was there and no one was standing over you telling you what you could, couldn't do. But I always kind of grip my teeth when I had to go down there because trying to get information and being professional around them was, <laughs> you know, okay, are we sober or high right now? Oh my I God. mean, uh, yeah. our joke was the movies of the 80s and 90s were all made by cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that is no lie. <laughs> so I got to say, I was always a sober person because that's just the way I was. And I didn't judge or anything. But when I had to get straight answers and deal with schedules and talk to people, I'd say, you're going to do that, right? Yeah. But what they were really doing <laughs> was shaking their head. <laughs> so on Fright Night, there was a lot of visual effects. And a little funny story, we hired another PA whose name he went by Jonathan, and he was a big guy, really nice guy, but he just didn't seem to get the knack of being a coordinator. And my boss told me, you got to fire this guy. I have to fire him? I didn't hire him. We'll just fire him. Well, <laughs> Just. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. I see that falls to me. Well, the next day I didn't have to because he said, I have mononucleosis and I have to quit. Well, I'm really sorry <laughs> about that, Jonathan. <laughs> and later when I went to the creature shop, like weeks later, there's Jonathan. So what are you doing? Guy got hired as an actor and he plays Billy Bones, the one who melts. Yes, on the stairs. That's him. Oh, oh wow. Okay. How a interesting. Little fact, you know who he is when he went on to do? He became one of the major writer producers in this business. The Jim Belushi show, all about Jim. What is that show? We'll we don't know because we're absolutely useless. I'm we'll sorry. do a fact check at the end. Yes. Yeah, please do. He's the one who created that show. Wow. wow. Big incredible. player, super player. It's like, well, he didn't make it as a PA, but he went on to become somebody big. That's amazing, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. They amazing. clawed his way out the trench. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I would always have to check at the creature shop. And are you familiar with an artist named Screaming Mad George? Yes. Yeah. He's a oh, very yeah. good friend. Society. He's famous for that film, Society, where they all stick together. Um, well, Screaming Mad George is a creature effects. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But he did all the creature effects oh, for okay. that. Oh, okay. Yeah. I didn't even know that. He was also a neighbor. His daughter and mine were good friends. That's so funny. But I met him, and he had just recently come from Japan, and his name was Joji Tani at oh. the time. And I had to submit all of the information voices for the people who were puppeteering they were being paid separately and which were all the creature shop people to the accountant the accountants are not nice people to deal with overall because they deal with so much problematic bean counting so i finally got everything straightened out and i would submit the invoices then one day i get the invoice from joji Screaming Mad George. What is this, Joji? <laughs> oh, that's my new name. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, really? It's legal? It's legal? It's, it's my name. It's like, okay, okay. So I don't say anything to the accountant. I just submit all the puppeteering voices, and sure enough, I get the call. Mary, yeah. Who's screaming mad, George? <laughs> said he changed his name legally. He goes, can he please, please be paid under Joji Tani? I'll ask him. Joji said, yeah, okay, that'll work. Okay, thank you. So that was just like <laughs> among the little things. That's but oh, I remember Amanda Beers, yeah. who played the female lead, she had to come to the shop for a full body cast, which meant being completely naked yeah. and having it. And so I had to go down there to chaperone because there was Steve Johnson. I forgot who the other person was who had to do it. And I had a few issues with some of the guys and their childishness. Yeah. And I had to coach them. I said, you are not going to be rude. You are not going to make leering faces behind her. You're not going to do any of that. I'm going to be no. there. I got my eyes on you. But they knew I wasn't kidding, so they behaved. And she was wonderful. She had to get into this whole body cast. She was a super trooper. She had the wide mouth, the didn't wide she? Mouth. Yes. Uh, which is such a great sure. classic effect. That, yeah, and they yeah. also had to enhance her once she is bitten and right. she becomes more voluptuous. Mm. They had to enhance her figure. 
group. And there were a few things that friends of mine were just talking about recently in that there were a few mistakes made. There was supposed to be methicil, which you know. Oh, yes. Is the a slime. Powder, the slime. Mm. And it was supposed to go into the mouth of the werewolf. Ed. Evil Ed. Evil Ed. Evil Ed. Evil Ed. Yeah. Yes. There was a little mistake made. Isn't methicil? Why can't he open his mouth? Why it's powdered glue? Oh, oh my oh. God. Yeah, okay, whose Ouch. fault was that? All right. Well, there were lots of little things like that. And I know that Steve, I believe, was the one who was going to make the eyes and the fangs for Sarandon yeah. playing that. And I was on set the day that they were using the fangs. And you could have probably done better with joke store fangs. Oh, really? Yeah, they just didn't fit well. And the contact lenses were killing him, causing problems. That didn't work. But he had to face Roddy McDowell, and his line was, you have to have faith. No, I... Try saying that with oversized say, you have to have faith. <laughs> he was sitting, oh and it oh, was just no. that sloppy. And it went on and on and on, and he was not happy. No. So finally, they just said, just say it. We'll loop it in. We'll do it with a voiceover match later. But lots of little problems yeah. like that were mm -hmm. chronic with the eyes and the teeth and the methicil. And the, finally, you never would have known because the film was so great. Yeah, you have no idea how many takes there were in sure. melting Billy Bones and the gelatin. And that finally was figured out. But right. um, it did turn out to be fine. But, oh, as you know... It, it's like a chemical process. Mm. You have to go trial and error because some of these things had never been done before. Exactly. It's magic and it's movie magic in its true sense compared to what you have now, quite frankly, where, you know, in the digital realm. Yeah, exactly. It's like I equate everything to cooking. You add too much salt, too much sugar, something expands, it, it crashes, you never know. So the time constraints on that were tricky too. Right. But they ultimately got everything done and many of these shots went round the clock overnight on the stage. Some of these guys were exhausted. Yeah. But it got done. It was a lot of fun Great and film. I enjoyed it. Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> And I just want to touch on A Big Trouble in Little China. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. my cousin Kate is in that movie. Oh, what does she play? She plays Margot. Kate Burton. Mm, really? My lovely cousin Kate. Never I, met her either. <laughs> <laughs> he's a bit sad because I've never introduced time. him to Richard, oh. my uncle Richard. Oh. <laughs> so he's a bit upset with me for that. Um, <laughs> But yeah, uh, so what did you do on Big Trouble in Little China? I was the production coordinator on that too. Okay. So just doing the elements and all that, I was very happy. I did get to meet James Hong. It's like, oh excellent. My, yes. He's so nice. Oh my gosh. Even at that time, he had such a scope of work behind him and the guy just keeps on ticking. He's a yeah. Timex. He's amazing. Yeah. I really like him. He's fantastic. Did you meet John Carpenter? I did. What's he like in real life? He seems a bit dusty. He's very sickly looking. <laughs> well, I was surprised when I saw him, but he was pleasant. He yeah. was very pleasant. He had also come by because his friend Nick Castle oh, yes. did The Boy Who Could Fly. The and shape. They did that at Boss too. And he was pleasant. He was not extremely effusive, rather quiet gentleman. But I'm a huge, huge fan. My number two favorite movie of all time is the remake of The Thing. Absolutely. Aliens being the first. But he's brilliant. And Assault on Precinct yeah. 13, what a great raw yeah. film for its time. But he came by. He was very pleasant very nice just got to meet him that time and uh yeah it was fun again a lot of creature shop stuff because there were people working on that big sentry the flying eye yeah. the big eye yeah. thing that disappeared mysteriously at the end of the film oh, really? yes and there was a bounty put out by the studio and there was rumor that it was never going to be seen again because it had been destroyed pinched, pinched and then destroyed over fear wow. of oh not so that's a rumor just uh, a rumor just right. a rumor huh. No. So that's sad. Yeah, there were lots of little things to do there. So I was over at the creature shop and I know that um, Screaming Mad George did a lot of work on that. In fact, the eye at one point fell off a table and was just smashed. And I remember George going, ah, ah, ah. oh, well, we start over. <laughs> He's the most patient human on 
the planet. Oh. And that was great fun. And yeah. I had keeping track of laser beams. Oh my God, it seemed like my life and laser beams. How many laser beams in this shot? How many are they adding? How many? Oh, I kept track of all of the elements. There were daily reports and we'd go to the dailies where you'd go yes. in and watch yeah. and I would take the reports. Well, that one's great. Okay, that one's a cut print. This one could be better, a CBB. Um, CBB. A CBB. <laughs> if we have time, we'll come back to that one. That one's no good, NG. So I would do that. And there were just a constant, how you doing? How you doing? How you doing? Going around to everything. That was a great fun And also film. that film, it's great because it mixes Asian with American action and creatures and design. Yes. And, and that was very unusual. I think that film's way ahead of its time dealing with all that. And actually, I'd like either a remake or a more exploration of that type of ghosts and stuff now would be brilliant. Well, I, think. I know that Richard Edlund really wanted to explore Kim Cattrall. <laughs> Boy, <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> but oh, who did she? She is gorgeous and sweet, and she would come through the shop and, like, you could hear all the jaws drop. <laughs> so. you know, I have to say something that's interesting this because my experience of working in makeup effects back in Britain during the 80s, we had quite a few female technicians, uh, artists in the shop. And I've got to tell you, the shop was also run by a couple of gentlemen who were gay. And so you had that whole gamut. We had black guys in there, we had Asian. For the 80s, that very was very unusual. Yeah. There was none of that shit. As far as I'm aware, the girls did not feel insecure or worried or any of that. The biggest comment was on Nightbreed where one of the makeup guys was looking at a female in blue with breasts and was like, oh, look at those. And it turned out it was actually one of our makeup guys <laughs> wearing fake breasts. <laughs> and that was about the most it ever got. So it's really interesting to hear this sort of... Well, uh, I mean, he wasn't rude or anything. He no. was the preeminent gentleman at all times. And there were lots and lots of women working at Boss. Right. Animators, one of the rotoscope supervisors was Anique Terrien, and uh, she was the boss. She ran that department and the creature effects people. There were a lot of women there too, model makers. So it was a very blended group as well. And yeah. if you were creative and you had the chops to do it, you were respected. And I thought that was cool. And I rose up, you know, being the PA to do this, that and the other. And um, I thought it was great. My supervisor was a woman. I didn't notice any kind of sexual discrimination yeah. whatsoever. Right. Really. But it was fun wasn't it because I think now quite a few of my friends back in the UK do makeup effects and it does seem even when I went back there to work on Doolittle and everybody was wearing their high-vis vests and it just seems a lot less fun now we had fun back then and it was still respectful there was this great idea that oh everybody was very disrespectful back then and blah blah and yeah. you say it wasn't happening where you were so it's kind of interesting isn't it yeah I mean just because you're attracted to someone so what everybody seemed to meet and get married on yeah. that thing and I'd say I met him on Ghostbusters divorced him on Gremlins too. So that, <laughs> I mean, that, that's kind of how I remember. <laughs> I think we should stop there now, Martin. Okay. Yeah, spoil sport. I mean, Mary's got some cracking stories. I just love that period of filmmaking in the 80s. So uh, here's looking forward to next week. All right. We'll see you then. Cheers. Cheers.